Our first reading today is from Jeremiah chapter 31. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, save O Lord your people, the remnant of Israel. For I'm going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here, with weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. We read responsively from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 7. The former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for our gospel. Alleluia, Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us. Speak until our hearts are stirred. Alleluia, Lord, we sing for the good news that you bring. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight 
and followed Jesus on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends, grace and peace to you this day from our triune God in whom we have our faith, our lives, and our being for all eternity. Amen. Today in our Gospel reading, we meet and we see blind Bartimaeus. When Jesus restored his vision, the Lord was just about at the end of his journey to Jerusalem. At this point in the story of the Gospel, Jesus was getting very close, along with his disciples and his followers. The writer, Mark, makes sure that we understand that his journey to the largest city, Jerusalem, is really important. But, like much of Mark, we readers understand this journey much better than the people closest to Jesus, even his disciples, the people who have been with him for the longest. The disciples Remember, they have just heard three times Jesus say with his own lips what was about to happen in Jerusalem and why that was such an important journey. Three times Jesus has told him, told the disciples, that he would be betrayed and handed over and tried and beaten and he would die and then he would rise again in three days. Three times Jesus told that to them. The first time Jesus told them, Peter rebuked Jesus. The next time, the disciples responded by arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. And the third and final time, just before this reading and this healing, two of the disciples, James and John, asked Jesus to do whatever they asked him to do for them. And the immodest duo asked that they sit at the hand of Christ when he amassed power and glory over the present rulers of Israel, we presume. My point, and the point that I think Mark is trying to make for us, is that the disciples, those people closest to Jesus, just didn't get it. They did not see what Jesus tried to show them about his mission and about his intent and about his journey into Jerusalem, about his work that he was in calling them into and participate with him. And they didn't get it. They just didn't see. I read this week a line that summed it up pretty well. In Mark's gospel, the disciples heard it all, but yet they heard nothing. And in Mark's gospel, the disciples saw it all, yet they saw nothing. It's like they were blind. And into that setting enter a blind man, Bartimaeus. Mark is wonderful in how he weaves stories together. Enter Bartimaeus. It's almost like Mark wanted to strike the point home to us at a time when it mattered most. The people that you would expect to see don't see. And like previously in Mark, the people you would expect to, to not see, the people that you would expect not to see at all, have faith and have vision and recognize Jesus and what he's up to. They even see who he is. That in itself might be enough of a message for us readers, even 2,000 years later. Because this healing story where Mark places it, and in the context of the disciples, and their response to Jesus describing what his mission was, well, it's a tale of caution for all of us who follow Jesus and who claim his name. 
It's a tale of warning for us Christians who might think that we see and understand and get it all when it comes to Jesus. It's a flashing sign against a kind of arrogance and self-centeredness that so typifies the disciples' response to Christ. Would we, I wonder, be among those who ordered the blind man to be quiet? Would we be among those who shut down his words of faith? Would we be among those who are more concerned with order than with what Jesus is doing before our very eyes? Those are questions that this healing story of Bartimaeus raised for us. Mark wanted the church, his church and our church, to ask those questions. And so we do. And while we ask those questions, trying to see what Jesus is doing, Jesus just keeps doing. Jesus just keeps being Jesus, as he was through this whole story Mark gave us. Jesus just keeps being Jesus and doing what Jesus does, revealing God to all humanity, showing more and more the kingdom of God to us who live in the kingdom of humanity. What Jesus does in this story was not at all dependent on the disciples seeing or understanding or even their ability to follow along. And what Jesus is doing right now is not dependent on our seeing or our understanding. We are blessed when we see. We are blessed when we understand, and we are blessed when we follow. But Jesus just keeps being Jesus and doing what Jesus does. If you don't believe me, Read the Gospel of Mark, and you will see that. Jesus does what Jesus does no matter what. Like so much of Scripture, the Gospel of Mark shows us that the good and gracious will of God is relentless and assured. That's one reason Mark calls his story from the very first verse, Good News the good news of Jesus. One way to share that good news and to reveal that good news to us is how Mark uses miracles through the gospel. The miracles of Jesus' ministry are good news in themselves, including, I think, and especially, the miracle of Bartimaeus regaining his sight. It's about sight, but it's about much, much more than that, too. All of the miracles, all of the healings, all of the casting out of evil spirits, and even the raising of the dead, those miracles that Jesus does in this very short, earliest gospel we have, these are amazing. People who saw them were amazed and astounded by them. But these miracles are also promissory. They're promissory. They promise more to come. They're a little bit like a down payment on life. There's more to come. They're a little down on a much larger debt. Now, I want to be cautious because economic and monetary examples and comparisons to ideas of faith can be problematic, they can be troubling, but I offer this one because I think it can be very helpful. We tend to understand economics. We live in a world where economics dictates so much of our lives. And when we make a down payment on something, on a home, on a car, or on a service, we do so in good faith. We make a down payment showing that we can pay more off, that we have the ability to pay more off, 
and we make a down payment promising to do just that. Economic comparisons are sometimes problematic. But seeing Christ's miracles as a down payment on life, every healing, every miracle that Jesus did as a down payment on life, even leading to eternal life, that helps us to hear and to see what Jesus is up to, to hear and to see the real promise of faith. Jesus, in the story of Mark's gospel, is just about to enter into Jerusalem on a mission of life and death to fulfill an ancient promise made by God to all of creation. He stops just at that moment to restore sight to Bartimaeus who sees for the first time and follows Jesus on the way. On his mission of death to life, to fulfill that ancient promise, a promise of healing, a promise of redemption, a promise of forgiveness, a promise of new life, even life out of death. Dear friends, that is a promise for you. That is a promise for each and every one of you, this day and forever. And that is a promise based on the good and gracious will of God. Amen.